<clears throat> hey y'all, Prophet David Taylor here. Hello to my Facebook audience. And, um, okay, I'm getting the error code. It's not coming up on Twitter from a Periscope audience. Sorry about that. Uh, I'll have to post it again later. Hopefully my camera flips. There we go. Hello to my Periscope audience. So, it's uh, Sunday, September 23rd, 2.30 p.m., my regular time for my broadcast. So let's jump right in. What's my tagline? My tagline is, God already told you what was going to happen if you had just listened to the prophets. Okay? So please like and share as you come on. Please like and share this video so uh, the word of God can go out to as many saints as need to hear it. If you want to support me, you can support me through my PayPal link. Uh, that's it on my Facebook page, and it's also in my Periscope profile. And then you can also look up Prophet David Taylor on Amazon Smile, where a portion of what you spend there goes to uh, my not-for-profit organization. Um, now, best place to find me online, I always hashtag everything I do with hashtag PDT. So that's always the fastest way to look me up. Regular broadcast is right now on Sundays, 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time, and then second Thursdays on um, 7 o'clock p.m. I do my series on No More Genies, and I know I'm, I still have more to post. Okay? All right, so let's jump right into the prophetic word for today. As always, you know I'm in prayer, and I'm asking the Lord, what does he want me to say? Before I come out, because if the Holy Ghost ain't saying nothing, I'm not saying anything. Okay? And that's always uh, the thing you want to remember as a prophet. And that's always something you want to remember when you listen to prophets. It's the Spirit of God speaking. And the Spirit of God will confirm the Word of God. And the Spirit of God is there to reveal the will of God. Okay? So God is just using us as earthen vessels, as vessels of clay as a part of his kingdom. But God don't need us. God doesn't need us for anything. When God uses us, he's giving us an opportunity to sow into his kingdom, to sow into that which is eternal, because the Lord's kingdom is the only kingdom that's going to last across eternity. Every other kingdom of man, if you think about it, eventually comes down. Just think about it. Any kingdom that we build no matter how long it stands and no matter how mighty it is in its heyday, it eventually comes down. But when God calls you to work in his vineyard, when God calls you into his kingdom, he's saying, I'm giving you a chance to invest into something eternal, something that's going to last outside of time. So that means when this whole universe collapses, Jesus Christ and his kingdom will still be there. It'll last eternally. So that's part of what it means to serve God. So that's why I say all the time, it's an opportunity. It's not, it's not, you know, it's not a punishment. It's not in any of the things you might have heard religious people say. Because God don't need me. What does God need me for? What was God doing to run the universe before I came out my mother's womb if he need me? What's God going to do after I die if he needs me? God don't need me. <laughs> it's an opportunity. Okay, so that's why I always like to encourage those of you that might be struggling with your call. You might feel a call from God and you might not want to do it. I stopped by to tell you God has given you an opportunity to invest into his eternal kingdom and it's something that's going to still be going after everything else collapses. If you don't do that, then whatever it is you invest in instead of God is eventually going to turn to dust. And there you have it. So that's not today's word. That's just a little bit of encouragement. All right. Today's word <clears throat> uh, is entitled Moving. Moving, M-O-V-I-N-G, moving. And our foundation scripture is 2 Samuel 7.10. I'm going to read out of the Berean Study Bible version first. 2 Samuel, that's in the Old Testament. Okay, uh, Samuel was the last great prophet before they instituted the monarchy. Okay, when God delivered the children of Israel through Moses, Moses was an Old Testament prophet, and he was the deliverer. But he didn't actually take them in the promised land. Joshua did that. Okay, and Joshua was a prophet. But Joshua was more a judge, and then that kind of led into, well, they kind of did what they wanted for a while. Then God instituted the judges, and then he instituted the system of the prophets full time. And Samuel 
is the last prophet that the nation of Israel had when they were still under the system of the prophets until they, <clears throat> until they switched to the monarchy and they started being ruled by kings. And that was the nation of Israel's idea. That was not God's idea. That's not what God wanted. That's what they wanted. Okay? So Samuel was the last great prophet over the nation of Israel when they were still under the system of prophets only before they switched to a monarchy. Okay? And Samuel was born. His mom was named Hannah. Uh, Hannah was living polygamy. She was a part of a plural family. She was the second wife. And uh, the first wife was having baby after baby after baby, and Hannah couldn't get pregnant. So she went to the house of God and cried out before God and asked God to please open her womb and give her a child. And God told her that the deal was she had been chosen to birth Samuel, but she had to give him up. She had to give him back to God because Samuel was called to be a prophet from the womb. And so uh, Hannah had to agree that if she was going to have a child, that first child, she had to give that child back to God because Samuel was going to be a prophet and he uh, was ordained a prophet from the womb. So if she was going to bear him, she had to give him back. So Hannah birthed him, weaned him, and then took him to the house of God and gave him to Eli. So yeah, it's a very interesting story, the story of Samuel. So I just want you to know a little bit about Samuel. That's who's talking. Okay. And he says, 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 10, And I will provide a place for my people Israel and will plant them so that they may dwell in a place of their own and be disturbed no more. No longer will the sons of wickedness oppress them as they did at the beginning. Okay, let's look at that in King James Bible. Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people, my people Israel and will plant them that they may dwell in a place of their own and move no more. Neither shall the children of wickedness afflict them any more as before time. New American Standard Bible, I will also appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them that they may live in their own place and not be disturbed again, nor will the wicked afflict them any more as formerly. Let's say a quick prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, I uh, come before you thanking you for your prophetic word, thanking you for being used by you, O oh God. Thank you for an opportunity to sow into your kingdom. Please speak through me, have me say what you would want to say it to, to further your kingdom, your word, your will, your agenda. Not my will, but thine be done. And I thank you for this gracious opportunity. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let me first off say something that everybody's not going to like. This word today is not for everybody. One more time, this word today is not for everybody. Okay. Sometimes when prophetic words are released, sometimes they are not qualified and they need to be because every prophetic word is not for everyone. Okay. And then, you know, I can't get into it all, but there are different levels of prophetic words. Some prophetic words are personal to a person. Some belong to a church, an entire congregation. Some belong to a region like the Midwest, the South. Some belong to nations, some belong to kings. So every prophetic word is not for everybody, but sometimes they are released unqualified. And then some prophetic words are indeed for the full body of Christ. Okay? This prophetic word today is not for everybody, and I'm going to tell you why. The prophetic word today is for people that are not just willing to accept Jesus Christ as Savior, but they're willing to accept him as Lord. Those are two different things. There are plenty of people in the kingdom of God that are indeed born again. They believe that Jesus is the son of God. He came down from heaven through Mary's womb. He died on the cross for our sins, was raised again the third day, and ascended to the right hand of God. If you believe that, and you receive that in your heart and confess that with your mouth, then you become born again. You become saved. You become a Christian. You become a part of God's family and you are uh, drafted into the eternal kingdom of God. But that's just accepting him as Savior. To accept him as Lord means that you surrender control of your life. <laughs> you surrender the lordship rights of your life to Christ voluntarily. And you lay down your agenda. You lay down your will. You lay down what you would have done with your life. And you instead receive God's plan for your life. That's found in Romans 12, 1 and 2. 
you receive God's plan for your life and you will discover that God's plan is better than your plan. God's plan is higher than your plan. God's plan will take you more places uh, than you could have ever gone on your own. Okay, and that's both in the spirit and in the natural. Okay, and so that's accepting him as Lord and that happens day by day, choice by choice for the rest of your life. Okay, you have to grow in Christ and the way you grow, grow in Christ is you learn how to submit. You learn how to obey. You learn how to, how to believe what the Lord is saying. That doesn't happen all at once. So you get saved in a moment of time. You get born again the moment you believe. That's accepting him as Savior. But accepting him as Lord is a lifelong experience. Every day for the rest of your life, when you get up, you get up and you say, not my will, but thine be done. You seek the face of God for his will for your life. And it's not going to happen all at once. Okay, you only experience life one day at a time. Okay, this word today is for people that are willing to accept Christ as Lord. You no longer, you no longer want to live by your own agenda. You no longer want to keep the Lordship rights to your life. You no longer want to do it your way, but you're willing to surrender and do what the Lord wants you to do. That's who this word is for today. Those of you that don't want to do that, many of you are going to die in the wilderness. Many of you are just going to go round and round and round and round in circles until you die. Okay? I'm talking to Christians with that too, by the way. I'm not talking about to sinners. <clears throat> I'm not talking to worldly people. I'm not talking about unbelievers. I'm talking about there are plenty of Christians who only want to follow God so far. They only want to follow God as far as they can see. They only want to follow God as far as they can understand. They only want to follow God as far as their mind can go, and then they don't want to follow God any further. <clears throat> if that's the kind of attitude you have towards the Lord, then I'm sorry to tell you, you're just going to spin around in circles until you die. Because when God wants you to move forward with his plan for your life, it's always going to be bigger than you. It's always going to be bigger than your mind can conceive. It's always going to be more than you can do in your own strength because God is calling us to grace, to depend on his strength. God is calling us to faith, to believe in what he can do, not just what we can do in our own strength. What's the point of becoming a Christian if you're just going to do what you can do in your own strength? Why'd you get saved then? If you're just going to live by your own strength, why in the world would you get saved? I mean, you get saved not to go to hell, but again, that's just accepting him as savior. That's the entry level position in the kingdom of God. If you want to go higher in the kingdom of God and you want to go forward with God, you have to accept him as Lord. And the Lord is always going to lead you to places that beyond what you can do in your own mind, in your own strength, through your own efforts. It's going to take grace. It's going to take faith. It's going to take perseverance. It's going to, it's going to require that you grow, that you become more than what you are right now. That's why a lot of people don't want to go. And if you don't want to go, I start by to tell you, you're going to die in the wilderness. You're not going to make it. You keep arguing with God and telling the Lord how this is supposed to go and how this is supposed to be. You're arguing with the potter. He's the potter. You're the clay. He's the creator. He invented you. You did not invent him. And if you keep trying to tell him how all this is supposed to go, he's going to let you die in the wilderness. He's going to let you just have it your way. OK, so you got to surrender. you got to accept him as Lord, not just a savior to get this prophetic word today. So this prophetic word is qualified. It's for those people that are willing to live God's plan and God's plan ain't going to look like none of what you thought. <laughs> it's not going to look like what you thought. Now, it's going to be better than what you thought, but it's not going to look like what you thought. And you're going to have to be willing to go with it. There are too many times in the scripture where people came to those turning points, they had to make a choice. Either I'm going to go with what I think or I'm going to go with what God thinks. God did that with Peter in Acts chapter 10 when God gave him the vision of all the four-footed beasts. And God told Peter, last week, the Gentiles, the heathen, the non-Jews, they were heathen, that you don't have anything to do with them. They eat the pig. They work on the Sabbath. They worship idols. That was last week. This week, they're your brothers and your sisters because they got the Holy Ghost just like you do. And God taught Peter that lesson by showing him unclean beasts 
And he said, rise, Peter, slay and eat. And Peter said, Re Peter rebuked the Lord and said, no, Lord, I'm a good Jew. I don't eat anything unclean. I eat kosher. And God said to Peter, that which I have cleansed, don't you call it common. And God was using that as a metaphor to help Peter understand that the Gentiles that you used to consider heathens and dogs are now your brothers and your sisters. They eat the pig. They eat bacon. They eat ham. They work on Saturday. They worship idols. All those things are, are offenses to the Orthodox Jew. And God told Peter, I'm saving the Gentiles now. They're just as much a part of the kingdom now as you Hebrews. And Peter had to make up his mind. Am I in love with my religion or do I love God? Okay, there are so many places in the Bible where, where, where God challenged people like that. That's what this is today. If you want the life that Christ has for you, it's better than the one you're living now. But the only way you're going to get there is to take up your cross and surrender your will and say to Jesus Christ, not my will, but thine be done. You're going to have to accept him as Lord. That's the only way it's going to happen. And if you don't want to do that, you want to keep on hating. You want to keep on being bitter. You want to stay in a spirit of unforgiveness. You want to stay in a spirit of envy or covetousness or a spirit of adultery, or a spirit of idolatry, you want to stay there? Like you're born again, but you want to be carnal? You're saved, but you tell God, I don't want to give my sin up. I want to, I want to keep hating. I, I hate my father, and I will hate my father till I die. Because my father wasn't no good. I ain't going to never forgive him. I ain't going to never give him a chance. I ain't going to even speak to him. Okay. If you want to say... I got hurt as a child, and the people that hurt me, I'm going to hate them till I die. Okay? If you want to say, well, I'm a Christian, and I'm having sex out of wedlock, or I'm going with a married person, <laughs> my girlfriend is married to somebody else, and my boyfriend is married to somebody else, and I'm a Christian, I know I shouldn't be doing that, but I love them. You don't understand, God, I love them. I love them very much, and I don't want to end a relationship. Okay? If you want to have it your way, God going to let you have it your way and you're going to die. And remember, death doesn't look like what you think it looks like. It could be a living death. could be a walking death. That's entirely possible. You could be walking around and be so empty on the inside. You could have a bunch of stuff with no joy. You can have a bunch of stuff with no peace. There's many things that can happen that can give you a living death. Or you could quite literally drop dead like Ananias and Sapphira. If you're not familiar with that story, in Acts, they were raising money and they made pledges. And Ananias and Sapphira were a married couple and they pledged a certain amount of money after they sold some land to Apostle Peter. But Ananias and Sapphira agreed to lie to Peter about the amount of money they sold it for because I guess they wanted to have keep some left over after they pledged. So they came before Peter one at a time. And Peter said, did you agree to sell the land for this much? And they said, yeah. And then Peter said, why have you agreed to lie to the Holy Ghost? And Ananias dropped dead. His wife came in later after they drug his body out. Peter asked her the same question. She, she said, yeah. She said, why y'all lied to the Holy Ghost? She dropped dead. That's New Testament. That's not the Old Testament. That's New Testament Christians dropping dead because they lied to God over some money. If they didn't want to give the money, they should have made the pledge. They didn't have to lie to the Lord about it. That's what I'm trying to tell you. This is not a joke. This is not a game. Okay? So this prophetic word is only for people that are willing to accept him as Lord and move forward with his plan for your life. Okay? So let me read that scripture again. And I will provide a place for my people Israel and will plant them so that they may dwell in a place of their own and be disturbed no more. No longer will the sons of wickedness oppress them as they did at the beginning. What does that mean? The title of today's prophetic word is moving. That means that God is getting ready to move you to the place he's promised you, to the place you've been waiting on, to the place that you've imagined, to the place of uh, provision that he's provided for you. And when God provides something for you, nobody can mess that up but you. Think about the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve messed that up for themselves. <laughs> God gave them a garden of Eden. God gave them a garden full of food, full of vegetation, full of everything they needed. And all they had to do was take care of it. That's where God is moving. Those of you that are in obedience, I can't stress that enough. Okay. 
I'm not one of those prophets that tells you that you can do whatever you want and still get the full blessings of God. That is a lie. Those of you that are in obedience to Christ, God is going to move you to a place of provision that's all yours. And then he says, and I will plant them. I will plant them. Sometimes in life, we, we understand transition and we understand being transient. And we understand going from one thing to the next. But eventually in life, you got to put some roots down, man. <laughs> You gotta put some roots down. You gotta you gotta settle down. You gotta get rooted. You gotta figure out who it is that you are and what it is that you're supposed to do and who it is you're supposed to be married to and 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 everything that God wants to bring out of your life. You can't just fritter your time away because you only have so much time. You only have so many days. And so God says, not only am I gonna provide a place, but God says I'm gonna plant you there. That means stability. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> And then he says, so that they may dwell in a place of their own. It's going to be, <coughs> I'm sorry, it's going to be all yours. It's going to be a place of your own. Some of us, some of y'all listening to me right now have never had a place of your own. <laughs> this might be the first time in your life that God said that's where he's taking you. And then it says that you're not going to be disturbed anymore. You know what that means? And then he says, no longer will the sons of wickedness oppress them as they did at the beginning. That means that sometimes you're in places in your life where the, where the enemy just look like he just on you all the time. And sometimes that's family members. Sometimes the devil jump in people that you related to and they just persecute you, especially when you're a child. They just hate you for being you. Okay? Sometimes that can be your parents, I'm sad to say. Sometimes that can be your siblings. Sometimes aunties, uncles, cousins. Sometimes people you go to church with. Sometimes people you went to school with. But it's like they just own you all the time. And they just they just hate you for being you and they let you know that. And we've seen that there are plenty of people like that with the advent of social media. They just want to hate. Well, God is saying, I'm about to get rid of that in your life. And I want you to imagine a life where you're surrounded by love. You may have never had a life <laughs> where, you're where you've been surrounded by love. But I want you to imagine where that, that nagging wicked, ugly voice of the devil is gone and you get to be in a place that's all yours where you're planted and you're stable and once you get planted and stable, what's going to happen? You're going to grow. You're going to bear fruit. You're going to produce and it's going to be all yours. And God said the sons of wickedness are not going to oppress you anymore. That also means that you've learned how to keep the devil out of your garden. That does not mean that the devil's going to stop trying to oppress you. It means that God has taught you how to fight well enough to where you know how to rebuke the devil. You know how to crucify your flesh. You know how to cut off wicked people. And you know how to, you know how to say, no more, I'm not having that in my life no more. See what I mean? Sometimes we have to grow. Uh, of course my phone would ring while I'm doing my broadcast. Sometimes we have to grow. <laughs> Sometimes we have to grow mentally and emotionally as well as spiritually to be able to keep the enemy out of everything God has given us. That's why sometimes it can take God a little bit longer to get us to the point where we're planted. Because there are many times in our lives where God would have planted us sooner, but we weren't strong enough. We weren't ready. We weren't stable. And it's not going to do God any good to put you in that place if you can't handle it. But for those of you that are listening to this word, that have been in obedience to Christ, the Spirit of God is witnessing in your spirit right now. Even as I'm talking, the Holy Ghost is resonating with your spirit to let you know that God's talking to you. That you're gonna, that it's time for you to move, move into that place, the place that God has provided, uh, and it's a place for His people that where you're gonna be planted and you're gonna dwell in a place of your own. It's gonna be all yours. And you're going to learn how to keep all that noise out of your life so you can prosper and grow. That's a beautiful thing. That's a beautiful thing. And I'm sad to say that not all Christians get there in their lifetime. That's one of the biggest tragedies of being a Christian if you die a wilderness Christian. What do I mean by that? I mean, you never get to, to the place in your walk with God. And it happens for different people at different times. So whatever age you are, don't feel bad. Okay, Daniel had strong faith as a child. King Josiah had strong faith as a child. Both of them boys had faith at eight years old. 
King Solomon has strong faith as a child. Uh, Joseph had his vision as a teenager. But Abraham was 75 years old when God called him. Moses was 80 years old when God showed him the burning bush. And Moses finally accepted his call in life. Apostle Paul was a grown man. Jesus had to knock him down off of his horse. Uh, so, I mean, wherever you are in life, don't feel bad. You're not too young. You're not too old. You are where you are. But I'm saying not all Christians make it there in their lives. Some Christians die <clears throat> as wilderness Christians. And that means you never quite make it to that place of where everything the verse promises, where you get to the place of God's provision, a place that he's provided for you, that where you get planted, and where you can dwell in a place that's all yours, and you're not going to be disturbed anymore. It's a place where you're free to be yourself, your authentic self, the person that God made you to be, not the, the person that other people expect you to be, or what mama and them say, or what society says, or all that. That means learning how to uh, depend on God for the right provision, for the money you need. That means ordering your thoughts, your mind, and your emotions the way God has. That's why I told you, you have to accept him as savior for this to work. It's not going to work if you're doing it your way. I'm telling you, I'm telling you now. Okay. Uh, learning to change your diet, learning how to eat the way the Lord wants you to eat so you can create health in your body. And so you can live as long as possible and enjoy the promised land and learning how to block out all that noise from the devil. Okay. For some people that happens early in their lives. For some people that happens in the middle of their lives. For some people, that happens late in their lives, but at least it happens. The tragedy of being a Christian is for the people it never happens for. Let me give you some practical examples of what that looks like. Struggling financially for your entire life. Everybody has ups and downs. But what would happen if you came to a point financially where you didn't have to struggle anymore? That means being married to the right person, because a whole lot of people are married. That don't mean you got the right one. A whole lot of people are married to the wrong person and they're trying to make it work. A whole lot of people are going to get married seven times before they die. What if you got the right bone of your bones, flesh of your flesh person, the person that God had ordained for you to be married to? What would that look like? What about your living space, the right house, the right condo, where, you know, wherever you want to live? What if you live in a space that's all yours, that's paid for, that looks like you? When you wake up every day, you just love your house, you love your condo, you love your living space, you love your neighborhood. What if what you do for a living, your profession, your vocation, what if you wake up every day excited about what you do? Okay, I was on an airplane yesterday and I was working on uh, my book. I'm working on a new trilogy, a new science fiction trilogy, and I was working on the book all during the flight. You know why? Because I love to write. Because I'm born to write, okay? What God has given me is a gift of words. So I'm a prophet, I'm an author, I'm a songwriter. What I do for a living has to do with words. See what I mean? So all during that flight, I was just all in my laptop just working on what I was doing because I love it. I love it. I love it. I love working through my characters and just everything I was doing. I love it. See what I mean? That's the way you're supposed to feel about what you do for a living. You're supposed to be doing what you were born to do. I love the prophetic. I love the prophetic flow of the Holy Ghost. I love prophetic worship. Okay? I love biblical prophecy. I love it. Do you know why? Because I'm a prophet. That's what I was born to do. I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. I'm not a pastor. When I was a young man, a lot of people tried to make me be a pastor. I am not a pastor. My anointing is not pastoral. I know pastors, and I know the pastoral anointing. I don't have that. I'm cool with that because I wasn't born or called to be a pastor. I'm a prophet. So I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. That's what I'm saying. When you wake up every day, do you have that sense of excitement? Do you have that sense of rightness? Do you have that sense of knowing that what I'm doing, I'm not talking about a job. I'm not even talking about a career. I'm talking about a purpose. Do you know when you wake up every day that you are living your purpose? I'm not talking about going to a job, and I'm not talking about having a career. I'm talking about purpose. Do you know that when you wake up every day, whether or not you live in your purpose, the reason you were, hey, God bless you, Victoria, the reason you were born, is that what you're doing when you wake up every day? 
Are you doing what you were born to do? Because if you're not, you're wasting your days. You're wasting your time. You're wasting your time on earth. You only have so much time on earth. Okay? So God is saying those that are obedient, he's going to move you to that place where you can have peace on every side, man. It doesn't mean you're not going to have to fight. You're still going to have to fight to keep the enemy out of your land. <clears throat> because remember, there was war in heaven. The angels had to fight the rogue angels. Okay? Remember that the devil was in the Garden of Eden. So until God completely gets rid of the devil, we still going to have to fight. But God will teach you how to fight to win. God will teach you that he will shut the mouths of your enemies. I've seen the Lord do it too many times. <clears throat> what people don't know, particularly about apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, but it's true about anybody in the body. I'm not saying that it's a special blessing for the fivefold ministry, but it's particularly true about fivefold ministries, but it's true for every Christian. When people are, whatever it is that they try to put on you, it's going to flip back on them. Just like the men that hated Chadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and try to put them in the fiery furnace, the fire didn't burn them, then they got thrown in. Okay? That's what it's like. Because God will fight your enemies for you. Okay? God will defend you. He will be your shield and your protector. That's promised land living. Old school living is when you try to fight your own battles. You try to fight in your own strength. That means you can only do what's in your hand. That's carnal living. That's worldly living. That's me trying to solve my problems in my strength. When you move to the promised land, you learn how to let the Lord be your shield. And every word that your enemies speak against you, God heard it, God recorded it. Hey, God bless you. God heard it, God recorded it, and recorded it, and God is going to turn it back around on them. See, that's promised land living. So again, I want to give you the right impression. It doesn't mean we're not still going to have challenges, and it doesn't mean we're not still going to have to fight, but it does mean we can have rest, meaning God will teach us how to fight. God will teach us how to clear out all that stuff out of our lives that's not like him so we can be planted, we can dwell in a place of our own, and we won't be oppressed or afflicted anymore. See what I mean? And one more thing I'm going to say before I wrap up. I want you to expect that level. Many times in life, we, we get what we expect. And if you don't expect God to do all that for you, you won't be listening to what he's saying. I want you to expect God to give you rest in every part of your life. There are seven foundations to life. I'm going to hold it up so you all can see what I'm saying. There are seven foundations to, to life. Spiritual, mental, emotional, physical, social, vocational, and financial. One more time. There are seven foundations to life. Spiritual, mental, emotional, physical, social, vocational, financial. Your walk with God, your thought life, uh, the emotions, the emotional pictures in your soul, your physical life, your relationship life, what you do for a living, how you make your money, and then your financial life, how you manage, you know, grow, expand your money. Okay? There are seven foundations for your life. I want you to expect God to give you rest on every side. I want you to expect it. I want you to set your mind to hear from the Lord starting today on how to get in this place he's provided for you. Where do you want me to be spiritually, God? Where do you want me to be mentally, God? What should I be feeding my mind? Where do you want me to be emotionally, God? What should be my general emotional state? Where do you want me to be physically, God? What's my diet and exercise routine? Where do you want me to be socially, God? Who have you brought in my life? Because I don't want anybody in my life that the Lord didn't bring. Okay? Uh, am I doing the right thing for a living? And how am I managing my money? Am I at the financial level I'm supposed to be, God? If I'm not, then show me how to get there. See that? Once you set your mind like that, then you, you can begin to receive what the Lord is saying in every side. And many times, this is not what we get in our religious background. In our religious background, we just get the spiritual. <laughs> we just get the spiritual. We just get one dimension of life. But there's seven foundations, and we just get that one. And that's why sometimes you see people that are just so deep in the spirit, but they don't know how to eat some fresh fruits and vegetables. They deep in the spirit, but they don't know how to invest finances. 
They deep in the spirit, but they don't know how to get along with people. Have you ever met people like that? They're developed in one dimension, and there are seven dimensions that you need to be fulfilled in. Can you see that? That's the difference between religion and relationship. That's why I don't preach religion. <laughs> I have a relationship with God. And like I tell you, every time I come on here, everything I'm telling you, I'm doing it. I'm doing it. My friends will tell you. Somebody told me yesterday they saw that I had lost weight because I changed my diet and my exercise routine. So I'm not telling you something that I'm not living. And I told you when I was on the plane, I was writing this trilogy I'm working. I'm going to release at least the first two books this year. At least this is my plan if the Lord says the same. But I love it. I love to write. That's what I'm supposed to do. Okay? That's why I can do it anytime, anywhere. And it the, the way you know you got the right thing is when you do it and you're not paying attention to the passage of time. When you're having so much joy in what you're doing, you're not paying attention to how time is passing. That's how you know you got the right thing. One of the ways you know you got the right person to marry is when y'all can talk and talk and talk and you don't run out of stuff to talk about and when you don't get tired of being around them. Some people, you can only take in small doses. <laughs> if you can only take them in small doses, you ain't supposed to marry that. <laughs> Remember I told you there are seven dimensions. You got to be compatible on some level on all them dimensions. If you're only compatible in one dimension, which is how a lot of people get married, a lot of people think that just because you have sexual chemistry, that's enough to build a marriage. That's not true. Your life is made up of seven dimensions, and if you want to join somebody else's life, you want to take two and make them one, then y'all got to be hitting on all seven of them dimensions. Only God could tell you that. Only God can tell you whether somebody's a match for you or not. You will never be able to figure that out on your own. You will never get somebody, because you don't get your own life half the time. You will never be able to get somebody else's life enough to pick a spouse on your own. You have to depend on God. That's what I'm saying. That's what God is saying, that he's going to move you to that place and plant you. Okay? And you don't want to be in your Garden of Eden with the wrong person. See that? So I want you to expect victory in all seven dimensions and begin to set your mind that way starting today. Everything with the kingdom of God is right now. Expect God to speak to you today. The Holy Ghost is speaking to you right now. Expect God to speak to you today about moving to that place where you can be planted, okay? And, and it'll be blessing beyond measure, okay? All right. If I have any prayer requests, put them on the screen and I'll pray before we go. Otherwise, I will pray a closing prayer. But if you want me to pray for anything, put that on the screen right now. I'll be happy to pray for you. <clears throat> now, last week, a couple of people put some things on the screen and I didn't see them. So if you're putting some stuff on the screen and I'm not responding, it's because I don't see it. So when I post these videos, uh, I'll go back. And if you put it on my Facebook page or Periscope or something, if I'm not seeing it now, then I, I promise you I will pray. If you put a request on my page and I'm not seeing it live, then when I see it on my page, I will stop and pray. Okay? All right. No prayer requests. All right. God bless you. We're going to pray then a closing prayer. Oh, wait. Okay. All right. The Spirit of God has given me a prophetic word to release. For behold, my people, it is the time, it is the season for you to move into your promise and your promised land where the devil and the demons and all of the wicked people cannot take it from you where you can be planted, where you can enjoy your life, where you can prosper, where you can flourish, where you can do what I have created you to do. I will instruct you. I will teach you in all seven dimensions. I will show you how to get victory in every area of your life, that you may enjoy the land, that you may live long, and that you may pass on what I have taught you to your children, that I might have a witness for my name in every generation of your family and on the earth. And as you believe and listen to me today, I will move today and show you how to move into the land that I have promised you, says the Spirit of the living God. Amen and amen. Well, I'm blessed by that. I'm excited about it and I'm with it. And like I said, I'm not just prophesying it to you. I'm doing it. Okay? All right. Thank you, God, for this day. Thank you for your mighty written word. Thank you for your mighty prophetic word. Thank you for the Holy Ghost, oh God, because it's not us. It's truly you. 
Oh God, we couldn't do anything without you. We, our eyes wouldn't even be open. We are dead in sins and trespasses and we are blind and don't know we blind unless you come and open our eyes. So we give you the glory. We give you the glory, God, that's do your name. Your name is do the glory. So we, we make a point to give you the glory. Thank you for opening your hand of grace and sharing with us. Thank you for giving us an opportunity to serve you, to love you, to know you. Thank you for, through our obedience, to moving us into the place you have for us, oh God. And we're excited. <coughs> we're excited about the days to come, oh God. We're excited about hearing your voice and following the leading of your spirit and reading your word and finding out how to get the fullest measure out of all seven dimensions of life and beating back the enemy and not letting demons and not letting wicked people and not letting bad thoughts defeat us anymore. So we're excited. We're, we're, we're hungry for it. Oh God, we're ready for it. And we're just expecting great things from you starting today. So we give you the glory. We give you the honor. We give you the praise. And when people come by and they see the blessedness of our life, we're going to be sure to give our testimony and say, Jesus Christ is my Lord, not just my Savior. He's my Lord. And Jesus Christ the good shepherd led me into these blessings because of his love and his grace and his goodness. So we thank you for being such a good God and we're excited about the future. And it's in Jesus' mighty name we pray and we give you thanks. Amen. Amen and amen. All right, y'all. God bless you. Thank you so much for tuning in live. And for those of you that watched the replay, remember you can always find me by looking up hashtag PDT. <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry, my throat's kind of scratching. You can always look up hashtag PDT to find me anywhere online, okay? All right, God bless you. I'll see you uh, next Sunday, same time, 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time. And remember, God's moving you to the promised land starting today. So get that spiritual antenna up and get ready to hear from the Lord, all right? God bless.